Um, if you don't know me, I know I'm still relatively new. My name is Pastor Tim. Uh, I often introduce myself as Tim, and that's just because I want people to approach me comfortably. So if you're not used to the church thing, if Pastor throws you off, that's cool. Um, I'll, we can still vibe, we can still ride. But uh, I, the most important person to introduce is my wife. Oh, glory. Love you, sweetie. Jillian, she, she helps pastor with me. We, we oversee the young adults and a few other areas, but she, she keeps me straight in the office, keeps me organized. Before she started coming in, my whiteboard looked like mental... And she came in there, she was like, no, Tim, you can't do that because people don't know what you're talking about. So <laughs> this needs to go here and let's set a date for that one and goals and objectives. And I said, you go, sweetie, you go. <laughs> go ahead, girl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to call your attention to the book of Joel real quickly. I'm going to be in Daniel, but uh, as I was sitting there, man, Holy Spirit... You know, he, he says stuff, and then you're like, oh, wow. I wish we would have talked about that a little long, a little while ago, but that's fine. Joel 2. Real quickly, um, verse 28, Joel 2, 28. Just a little background for you. Uh, what's happening here is Joel is a prophet. Uh, that means he speaks for God. All right, in Israel, you had, you had, you had your kings, they, they're your government, you had your priests, right? they're your religious leadership, and then you had your prophets. They were kind of like the Supreme Court, the checks and balances system, if you will. All right? This is a rough sketch of how the Bible works So, uh, in the Old Testament. So what we have here is a prophet, Joel, speaking um, on behalf of God to the people. And what is, what, he's, he's, he's just said a lot, right? Chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2, a lot is being said. And basically what he's saying is, get ready, judgment's coming. All right? And, and no one claps after that. You know, that's just, just a hard word to preach. Judgment's coming. And everybody's like, really? Really? Thanks, Joel. <laughs> and, and, so, and so, but he keeps, he keeps talking, and, and our God is so loving and so wonderful. As Joel keeps speaking for God, you start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And in verse 28, it says this, It will come about after this, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, or humankind. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. That's important to note. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I'll stop there. This is just a brief thought. This isn't even the sermon. This is the free part. You'll pay your tuition later. God says, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all humans. I'm going to pour out my spirit on all humans. What that, what that means for us, a, a lot of talk has been given about the last days, the end times. Pastor Ken and I, this is our end time series, right? Between Iraq and a hard place. Between Iraq and a hard place. Get it? Iraq, Iraq. Huh? See what we did there? <laughs> Between a rock and a hard place. And, and you, you, maybe you've read books that have told you about the signs of the times. Or you've heard the radio shows and, and it feels like fear. It feels like destruction is being preached. It feels like, Joel, judgment's coming. Thanks. Right? But there's something that we can look forward to that the prophet Joel speaks to. He says, in those last days, in those times of destruction, in that last hour when it seems like everything's crashing down, when God isn't in the society anymore, when people don't seem to be very moral anymore, there is one thing that you can look forward to, and that is in those days, I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, on all humankind. What does that mean for you and I? We have a certain hope that we can, we can know with, with certainty that God in this last day, I have the benefit of your spirit. Romans records it this way. The very same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in us. The, 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 John the Revelator recorded it this way, that Jesus said, 
I must go, but when I leave, I'm going to leave you my spirit. What that means for us is that we're not alone in this last day and age. So sure, the Middle East may not make a much sense right now. Fine. Your students are going through a lot of trouble in their school system. It seems like you try to teach them truth at home, and then they go to school and get messed up and come back home, and you're like, who taught you? <laughs> but we don't fight against flesh and blood. So we don't get worried like flesh and blood would. Why? Because he's poured out his spirit. So we walk by the spirit, not after the flesh. Amen. That was free. Between a rock and a hard place. Between a rock and a hard place. Turn to the book of Daniel chapter 3, if you would. Sermon title for the day is I Won't Bow. I won't bow. You know, the church is very much in a, in a turbulent time. Um, we've never been more divided than we are. We've never seen more confusion than we see now. Uh, it, it's it's baffling sometimes when you take a step back and you look at it. The church universal is experiencing some real difficulty, some real hardships. I mean, there is nothing new under the sun, of course, but it just seems that in this day and age, things have gotten real bad. It seems like we don't have quite the same voice we once had. You know, there was a time in the not so distant past when the church had a voice in the culture. Sure, some of it may have just been surfacey, but at least there, were pr there was prayer in schools. At least it wasn't a fight to keep Christ in Christmas. Right? And Merry Christmas indeed. But it, it's, it's tough now looking at where we are and saying, God, what has happened to your church? I don't know if you've asked yourself that question, but it seems as if the church has struggled in the culture, lost its influence in the culture. But at the end of, at the end of it all, there's a quote that I heard from one of, one of my favorite pastors. He said, it's theologically irresponsible to put off the promises of God for a time in which you have no responsibility. What does he mean by that? Yeah, it's, it's tough. It's hard. It, 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 things are crashing down all around us. The, the society is, is just gone rogue. But it would be irresponsible to put off what God has promised for today for a later time when things get better. Oh, you know, when Christ comes back, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. Yeah, but he also said that you go make disciples of all nations. Oh, see, but you don't understand. We're, we're in a time of persecution. And I will be with you until the very end of the age. <laughs> see, this is our gospel. This is our faith. So it's theologically irresponsible to put off the promises of God for a time in which we don't think we have any more responsibility. Another example would be, you, you read it in Joel. He said, what, your young men, uh, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will, will, will see visions. Oh, God, I'm too old. Says who? You're going to dream dreams. What does that mean? You're going to be able to see into the heart of God and be able to speak it through your dreams. So who cares if you're part of the senior club? Get up and start dreaming. God doesn't have any retirees. And what else did it say? It said your young men will see visions. So you're not too young. You're not waiting until you join the church. You're not waiting until you become a senior member on the leadership team. No, you, dream, you see visions. What does that mean? You cast a vision for where the church is headed. 
You can't do that if you have your head under your arm, just focused on yourself and how I'm not. They don't love me at this church and they don't have enough programming for me at this church. And, and ha. Ah. Or as, as my very Ghanaian father would say, ah. <laughs> Who told you, huh? <laughs> Said that I will pour out my spirit on men as well as women. Men as well as women will prophesy. So ladies, you're not off the hook. And men, we need to create room so that the ladies can minister. Oh, amen. This is why Paul in, in the book of Galatians said there's neither male nor female, slave nor free, Greek nor Jew, for Christ is all and in all. We are new creations created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Carriers of the ministry of reconciliation, not our gender. Glad to be a man. Thank God for it. I like the way my mind works. I appreciate being a man. But that does not entitle me to some sort of right within the kingdom. Amen. The believer's responsibility is to believe. And to do those things which will help us believe. That's why worship is so important. Because it, it, it enables us to engage the Father for who he is. It, it puts us in a position of recognition, of, of experience, of, of exchange, right? Our praise for his revelation. Something you, you, you can know um, if you're going through a tough time, if you're going through something difficult. Praising God, worshiping God, opening your mouth to declare the wonders and the goodness of God enables you to see who God is, see his character. And that's the place of breakthrough, right? So, so worship is something that an, it, it helps the believer. It exercises our faith so that we can believe because it's our responsibility to believe. We have responsibilities in these last days, not just to sit and wait. Oh, Father, we, we await your coming. Yes, we do. We have a hope, but we also have a job. <laughs> Amen. I'm, I'm going to get to my message, actually. <laughs> I'm having fun. <laughs> Good. Not too long ago, I was at a conference, the Alignment Conference. Uh, with David Kinnaman, and, and he's a phenomenal researcher out there in California. He does a lot of research uh, with with the church and and just some fascinating things. But he he, he made an interesting point um, that that I want to share with you. He he referenced the time that we live in as a digital Babylon. It's a digital Babylon. A little history for you. Uh, Babylon was this Mongo world superpower. It just took everybody by storm, right? The world is kind of existing in local powers. Somebody gets big in this region, another king gets big in that region, and it's kind of going like that for a while. Well, out of nowhere, Babylon arrives on the scene and they're taking everybody. They're just wiping everybody out. Every, all of a sudden, everybody's speaking the Babylonian language, everybody's painting their eyebrows looking like a, Bab like a Babylonian, you know, it's just, it's crazy. Um, and so in, in the book of Daniel, we read the story. We get a firsthand of, account of what it's like to live in your own land and be overrun by the Babylonian mob. And so in chapter 3, um, we are already familiar with, by the time we get to chapter 3, we're already familiar with Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and uh, Mishael, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Daniel, right? Okay, so in chapter 3, what's happened is the king, Nebuchadnezzar, has, well, he's been off his rocker, but now he's really, really crazy. And he's decided to construct an image some 90 feet tall by 9 feet wide. I mean, if that's not narcissism, I don't know what is. Of himself. He constructs this golden image of himself, 90 feet tall by nine feet wide. And he, he makes a decree that when you hear music, when the chords strike, you must bow and worship my image. 
whatever, dude. So the culture is just kind of like, well, bow to the image or be thrown in a fiery furnace. I'll bow to the image. And so it's kind of like, it's not because the people love Nebuchadnezzar. It's because they love their lives and they want to keep them that way. So they, they're bowing to the king, to the king's image, and, and every, everything's going great. The king's happy. The people are alive. And then all of a sudden, they come across these three. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, who will not bow. Let's read it. Daniel chapter 3. I'll begin at verse 14. It kind of gives you the, uh, the summary of what's happening. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you're ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? It sounds a lot like our culture. This is what I mean. You, you, you step into society, right? You step outside of the church, back into the world, and, and all of a sudden what they begin to tell you is, hey, listen, it's fine to have your God. Great. Cool. Have him. Jesus, you love him. That's fine. You're good. I'm good. But when this hot button issue gets raised up, you bow. You think the way we think. All right? This is, this is the decree. Or you get thrown into the fiery furnace of being called a bigot. You get thrown into the fiery furnace. Put your label there. Right? All sorts of labels. You get ostracized from the community, right? The, the, the friends that you thought you had. All of a sudden, you take a stand for God in the classroom, and all of a sudden, now you're no longer cool enough to, to hang with. Now no one else wants to hang with you. No one else wants to, you, you're not cool enough to go out anymore. On the job, you used to be on the inside, you used to be in the loop of what was happening in the office, but you took a stand, and now all of a sudden you get all the memos late. You don't get invited to any of the office dinners, the office luncheons. You don't, when they go to Jimmy John's, you get left out. It's laughable, but it hurts. We were created for community, so anytime we're kicked out of the community, it hurts. It's not fun. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, not only are they away from home in this foreign land trying to navigate their way through this. We are foreigners in this land. We're aliens on earth. But not only are we navigating that part, but then as aliens were being ostracized for the stand that we take. They were being ostracized for the stand that they would take. And so the king puts this ultimatum on the table. Bow or be burned. And now let's listen to their reply. Shadrach, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the, go the golden image that you have set up. Hey, now. Let's just talk about this for a second. Three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they hear the king's ultimatum, feel like this is just, this is the Tim version, Tim Quainu version, TQV, right? They, they looked at each other. All right, king, we've heard you. And so this is, this is how we feel, isn't it, brothers? Yeah. Our God will deliver us. He'll deliver us from you. But let's say he doesn't. We're still not going to bow. 
Now, now, before we celebrate that, that ostentatious move of faith, before we get to celebrating their bold stand, their courage in the spirit, before we celebrate their holy stance for the gospel, let's look at their lives. These were some disciplined young men. See, there was a time before they got to the furnace, before they were elevated to prominence in, in, in the land where they were just some slaves. They were just some guys brought in to see if they could make the cut. It's when they first came to Babylon. And when the king said that this is the food that you're going to eat, and this is the environment you're going to learn in. And what did these young men say? We will not defile ourselves from your table. Now, I just happen to believe it wasn't so much about the food, it was the principle. That we are not going to just accept any old thing that you decide to shove down our throats. No, no, no. We are going to live from principle. That we're going to do what God tells us to do. They were people of faith. That's the equivalent of us walking in the spirit and saying, you know what? It may be fine for you to do that. That may be your thing. But I am determined to walk by the spirit of God. Many times people will look at you during a defining moment and judge you based on what they see. But when the Chaldeans who accused these men didn't know, what they didn't know was that Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael had been about that life. They bought this baby? Ain't nothing new? Same game, different stage. I ain't scared of you. We out here, man. What, is, what you want? You want those in the furnace? Throw us in the furnace. Elsewhere, Daniel. Now, you know, at first, it was the four of them together. We in this, man. And then they, 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 they got separated. Now Daniel's over here and the three are over here. No problem. Daniel re reports to them, hey, man, I'm going through something. We got you in prayer. Then Daniel goes off, right? What, what we now see in, in elsewhere in the story, elsewhere in the book of Daniel, is that Daniel gets faced with a similar challenge. Bow like the rest of us or be decimated. And what does Daniel say? Get thrown to the lions. What does Daniel say? He, he does the exact thing that's going to get him killed. Oh, you're going to kill me if I go pray? Watch this. Same thing, saints. Listen, I'm not telling you to go tell your boss off in the name of Jesus. But what I am telling you to do... What I am telling you to do, what I am asking you to join me in doing is let's go back to the root of our faith. It is, it is our God who has transformed us. We don't have to always put him through our political filter to make sure that he comes out looking like a good guy in our culture. He won't. Jesus didn't. The apostles didn't, they, told, they grabbed these men, they beat them, they did whatever they wanted to do with them, and they said, okay, we'll let you go, just stop preaching in the name of Jesus. As soon as they released them, what do the disciples go and do? They start declaring the wonders of God and the fact that they got beat for the sake of the gospel. What does that look like for us? Man, listen, if you're going to get made fun of in school for... for taking a stand for God, you're taking a stand of purity. Fine. Take a stand for purity and be bold about it and, and refuse to bow. You're going to get in trouble uh, on the job for, for being a person of prayer or for carrying your Bible in a visible way. Well, listen, I'm not telling you again to just be combative for the sake of being combative, but by all means, let's not try to hide who we are. Let's not try to run away. Be led by the spirit by all means. All right. This is don't come back saying you got me fired. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. 
because it told you to walk by the Spirit. The Spirit didn't tell you to do that, did he? No, he didn't. But let's refuse to bow. When did the church become so weak-willed? The day we stopped walking by the Spirit. We, um, in Pastor, Pastor Ken's class, our, his, his Wednesday night Acts class, we were, we were in the book of Acts and we were looking at the story of Stephen and how Stephen, uh, the, well, the church really was going through so much turbulence and there was so much persecution happening. Uh, people were being stoned for the sake of the gospel. Stephen is the first recorded martyr in the Bible. And, and, and why were these people so bold? Well, there was something that happened way back in chapter two. They were endued with power. Full of the Holy Spirit, they began to speak. Full of the Holy Spirit, they began to do the do's. They began to walk in signs and miracles and power. You and I should be doing the same thing. But before we get to the miracle part, before we get to the conversion because of our evangelism part, there's a filling of the Spirit that needs to happen. There was a secret place to head to. There's a secret place that we need to head to. Let me wrap this up. I want to be cognizant of your time. Many of you who, who have gotten to know me a little bit, or those of you who have, uh, I love the game of basketball. It, it was only a few years ago that I realized I wasn't going to the NBA. <laughs> At all. <laughs> you know, after high school, you kind of like, all right, all right, I didn't get a letter. That's fine, that's fine, but you know, I could be undrafted. I, I could go undrafted. I could start as a ball boy, they'll see my skills when I pass the ball, you know, I'll pass it to LeBron, and they'll see, you know what I mean, who I, am, who I is. Pastor Paul, they never called me. <laughs> Even when Derek Walls went down, they didn't call me. You know, they just... No love, Chicago. Love the game of basketball. To my fellow athletes out there, you know that the greats weren't born in the spotlight. If you're not a basketball lover, that's fine. You music lovers, theater lovers, you know that the greats are not born on show day during the free feature presentation. That's not where they just suddenly are beamed down. Sure, some may be gifted. You can't teach height. <laughs> I'm a witness. But there is a such thing as practice. There is a such thing as... In, in the sports world, in the basketball world, we call them gym rats, all right? People who, as soon as the lights look like they're about to be on, they're in the gym shooting. Just 500 shots, 1,000 shots, 5,000 shots. I remember one basketball player, his goal for the summer was to shoot 10,000 baskets. Some of us are like, why? <laughs> he wanted to be the best shooter. And he figured, if I practice shooting more than anybody else, I'll be the best shooter. And for a season, he was. Right? The best are not born in the spotlight. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were not born in the spotlight. True legends are born in the hours and hours of commitment and disciplined passion that they exercise and practice. T.D. Jakes put it this way. He said, most of us don't really know what it takes to be great. He said, if you stop to think about it, Jesus put 30 years of preparation into a three-year ministry. Now, I'm not preaching a works faith or a works gospel by any means. But what I am saying is that a lot of us need to realize what we've been given, that God has poured out his spirit in these last days. And if we're not seeing the results that we want to see, then we need to get back into the secret place and start practicing the things that God has already given us to do. Before Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had the courage to stand up to the fiery furnace, they had the courage to stand up to their diet in the secret place. See, no one would have known 
if they would have eaten the meat. No one would have known if they would have changed their dietary plans even just a little bit. But what did they do? When no one was looking, when no one was paying attention, when the spotlight wasn't on them, when they were not elevated yet, they had integrity. They had a faith that could endure. Some of us need to get back into the secret place and begin believing God again for the things that he once promised us. Not putting it off, oh, well, that's for Pastor Stacy. Oh, that's for Pastor Ken and Crystal. You know, they get breakthroughs. I don't. Who told you? He poured his spirit out on all humankind, irrespective of age, of gender, of ethnicity. So get in your secret place and start hearing what Holy Spirit has for you to do. People of God, sometimes you just need to trust God after you've trusted God. I mean, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, now look at it. They have been serving God in their own land. Dedicated Jews. Following God. And their land gets overtaken. Okay, God, no big deal. We'll keep serving you. Now, they're in the hot seat. Because not only are they enslaved to, to the king of Babylon, but now they're brought into a place where they're visible. So they can't just serve God in their corner, in their cubicle. Now they're out in the open. Now they're managers. And managers in Babylon, they don't serve God, Jehovah. They don't serve Yahweh. They don't talk like that. They don't look like that. They don't dress like that. The, the managers, the people in prominence, we act like this. That, I think that happens maybe to some of us. That when we were uncool, when no one wanted to be our friend, it was fine to read our Bible at lunch. Wasn't a big deal to be praying in the hallways. Wasn't nobody near you. <laughs> Believe me, I know. I could shun on my way on down to English. Didn't nobody care about me? But all of a sudden, people start hanging around me. And now, what does my language sound like? What has my vocabulary been changed to? Right. Have I continued my enduring faith that, God, I still believe in you? And whether these people stay or they go, they're not the ones who gave me this joy in the first place, so they can't take it away. In Paul's, letters, Paul's letter to the Romans, he exhorted them not to be conformed to the pattern of this world. Not to let the world squeeze any of the believers into its mold. People of God, we, sometimes we just got to say, I'm not going to bow on this one. I, I, God is too faithful. I'm going to keep giving. I'm just not going to bow. God, God is too good. I'm, I'm not going to curse him now. God is too good. I'm not going to quit even though this doesn't look fun. When I said I do, I meant I do. And God, it was not just to my wife. It was to you. I won't bow. It's, it's an internal decision. It is an internal disposition towards God. Faith is believing. God, I'm not moving. You're not moving. I'm not moving. Put it this way. God, I'll stand here as long as you'll stand with me. And seeing as how you said you're never going to leave me nor forsake me, I guess I'm not going nowhere. Three things I want you to remember, and I'll let you go. First, you got to choose who you're going to serve. These are for my notes, people, right? Babe, I'm learning. I'm learning to be organized. This, choose who you will serve. Choose. Make a decision. Who are you going to serve? Faith is a decision. Who are you going to serve? It's a decision to be aware of God. That's, what, that's my definition of faith. A decision to be aware of God. What has he made available? What did he do? Do I believe it? Choose who you're going to serve. Find people to walk with. This is the second point. Choose who you're going to serve. Find people to walk with. If you ain't got no friends, that's fine. I know that struggle. Believe me, many a night. I, I was a pastor's kid. I'm still a pastor's kid, right? Uh, many a night, many a Friday night, 
on my knees. Jesus, please bring me friends. <laughs> it's funny now, but, but I, I know that struggle. You, you, you just feel alone. You feel like no one else understands. No one else knows what it's like to have to make a stand all the time, all the time. My beliefs are on the chopping block. I'm always in the hot seat. That's fine. I understand that. That's something to vocalize to the Father in the secret place. Jesus went through it. Imagine what it's like to go back to Galilee. You heal everyone who shows up in your presence. And when you start doing the wonders and signs and miracles, the people you grew up with start talking bad about you. Oh, well, he's just Jesus. Just Jesus. The dead are being raised. No big deal. Our Savior knows what it's like to be alone. And so find, choose who you're going to serve. Find people to walk with. If you can't find anybody around you now, cry out to God. He will answer you. He will come through. The final thing is you are not alone. When these three boys were thrown into the furnace, their haters got burned. The people who bound them up were burned, but they walked around in the fire. Let's not be afraid of the fire. Let's not be afraid to go through some things. And come out on the other side, a testimony of God's faithfulness. Sometimes going through the flames of life serve not only to test you and refine your faith. Sometimes the fires of life come to create a no hater zone around you. God has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. The gospel of Matthew records the words of Jesus that he said to his disciples, I am with you even until the very end of the age. You have the Holy Spirit operating on the inside of you. Of whom shall you fear? Or what some of my southern friends say, what you scared for? <laughs> Saints, let's not be afraid of the times that we face. We know that our God has promised to be with us. He commissioned us to be light in a dark world. He gave us the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Saints, I'm not repeating these phrases because I'm running out of things to say. I just don't really see a reason to talk about anything else. The same spirit that raised the single greatest miracle that change forever the course of human history the course of the world has been forever changed that spirit that power operates on the inside of me and you we are world changers we think globally locally but globally we make disciples of all nations. It's not just a badge on living, water's st on living water's chest that this is a diverse house. It is a great thing that God has overcome the impossible, but it is a testament of what God can continue to do. This is not the resting place. It's not enough that there's every color. Let's bring more. Let's go find the people who don't look like us. Let's see, what will God, what's the impossible thing that God wants to do in 2014, in 2015, in 2016, in 2017, and on and beyond, to infinity and beyond? What are the impossible things that God has allowed our old men and our old women to dream dreams about, allowed our young men and our young women to see visions for? What has God given us to do in this day, season, and time? Stand on your feet if you would.